am here, I feel very fortunate to be sitting here with these two, uh, these two legends. So I'm actually here with Court Davies and Janine Shepherd. So Court Davies lives in San Clemente right now. Janine is from Sydney, Australia originally, but lives in Wyoming right now. Now, most of you watching this probably uh, know Janine's story if you're uh, part of my audience. So Janine was a national ski champion who had qualified for the Winter Olympics in Calgary, uh, but after a tragic accident, she was airlifted to hospital, spent 10 days in a coma, uh, six months in the spinal ward and is still a paraplegic today. I mean, I can't even, you know, how many times did the doctors tell you something that you, uh, that you shouldn't be able to do, which you've made uh, a whole career out of proving people wrong. And two years ago, Court Davies was given a terminal cancer diagnosis and given three years to live. But rather than sit there in a room sheltered from the world, he decided to get out there and help try and inspire the world around letting them know that there are more options rather than just feeling the effects of cancer. You can go out there and still have a lot of life to live and the effects of having a positive mind and meditation and all these different things which you're going to get into today. So thank you very much, both of you, for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. All right. Man, you look, niggas look really good. <laughs> <laughs> the first question, there might be tears during, uh, during all this is as well but the very first question that I wanted to start with because we're talking about some pretty serious stuff here I mean we all face enormous adversity in our own lives but very rarely is it the extreme circumstances that these two people have been through but that's the opportunity for all of us watching right now being a part of this conversation to say well what is the adversity that they faced and what can we learn from this adversity as well so just as we start with this very first question if you're watching right now let us know where you're tuning in from and if you've got a question for either of these two we'll try and get onto these questions uh, at some stage during the broadcast as well so the very very first question that I wanted to start with uh, and I don't know which one of you wants to take this one off, but uh, what ladies was, first? Oh. Ladies first. It's a gentleman. <laughs> what yes. was the absolute rock bottom moment of your circumstance? Where in your life did you feel absolute rock bottom, where all hope was lost, Janine? Well, for me, it was when I got home from hospital because I refused to believe the prognosis and that is that my injuries were permanent. I went home, I was in a wheelchair, um, in a pl plaster body cast, I had to learn to use a catheter. I was told that I would never be able to go to the bathroom normally again. Um, so it was all very humiliating in, in many ways and I just refused to believe it and I went home and I guess that moment when I was out of hospital, um, you know, hospital actually, you can feel very normal you, in a hospital because everyone else is like you and suddenly you get home and you realise, hey, th this, is, this is reality now. And I think that was that moment, you know, maybe a few weeks after I got home in my room on my own at night and I realised this is it, this is my life. And I thought, why did I come back to this body and, you know, I, I can't be an athlete anymore. And I think that was my rock bottom. And I actually remember this very seminal moment of uh, pulling myself onto the ground covered, you know, I, my whole body was in a plaster body cast. And I remember I said this this cry this prayer which was god show me a way out of this or show me a way through it because i just i didn't want to be there anymore and that was um for me a moment of complete and utter surrender to my circumstances and it was also um, as i said a very seminal moment god i get chills you probably do as well Cor, i did i the, did the the show me a way through or show me a way out thing i mean we really only get uh one go at this life and and giving it everything you got it's such a, a powerful reminder of these extreme adversities that we go through but also that you never really know what's going on behind closed doors like there's a whole world that's happening while you have that feeling alone in your room right now as or you know at the at the time as well so uh, an extraordinary situation but of course it's important then to you know to have the conversations and start that uh, process of, of being reborn especially uh, as you had to adjust to that new normal as well which I know we're going to go through in a lot more detail uh, as well 
Uh, Court, what about with you? So what was your absolute rock bottom? So the, a, a big difference between these two as well is obviously they're both dealing with a lot of ongoing health struggles day to day. Both spend uh, way too much time uh, in hospitals and things as well. So Janine's accident, what year was that? Was it 88? Oh, yeah, no, I had the accident in 86. But, um, you know, I, most people find it quite incredible that I'm actually a paraplegic. I am walking, but I have all of the injuries of someone in a wheelchair so it is an ongoing thing it's a day-to-day um every single day you know i live with my my injuries yeah and and here with court obviously Mm -hmm. still fighting this uh this extraordinary battle as well and i mean the courage of of these two that's why i do feel so honored and so grateful just to be sharing uh the room and the microphone with these two as well so court would you mind sharing what you feel was was your absolute rock bottom that you've that you've felt along this journey yeah so uh you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. You said that in the hospital you felt normal. For me, mm. my rock bottom happened in the hospital. Yeah. Um, but a different situation, though. Mm. Uh, my rock bottom was eight months ago, which is really crazy to say. Mm. And so I had um, I had newly moved to San Diego to kind of be in the sun and 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 kind of change up my medical team. And I got here, and within. Not not even within a week of getting here, I got an X-ray, uh, MRI, and they had missed that my spinal cord was like a piece of paper around my T6. It was so compressed, and uh, they were like, "You need spinal surgery." And I had just had spinal surgery a year before, so this would be my second spinal surgery in in two years. And so I'm you know excited to be in California. I'm excited to kind of start a new life. I'm excited to you know get my life going and all of a sudden they're like you need surgery and I'm like wow the the doctor who uh saw my MRI was like how are you walking right now like he 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 couldn't even believe that I had feeling in my legs uh because my spinal cord I mean if I showed you a picture it was like this and he's like are you getting are you having any you know any pain in your leg I'm like no I'm like no I I was running I was playing golf like the week before Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that might be testament to my mindset and, you know, kind of, you know, he's just like, oh, the body's amazing, right? And so this man proceeds to tell me that, you know, I don't know how you're walking. And then we go to schedule the surgery and he's like, I can see you in a month and a half. And I'm like, what? So imagine this, like, uh, this fear I have of, of paralysis because he's like, you know, the chances of you being paralyzed from the waist down were, are very high. And so... I did some praying and some meditating and uh, a friend of mine called me from Washington DC who was a doctor and I just he just happened to you know think that something was was up and I told him it was up I sent him the MRI he came he flew to San Diego we flew back to Washington DC where I have no family and his great his good friend was a spinal surgeon and they he, the guy canceled the, the next day to see me that's how severe it was he did an MRI he came in the room this was in January of this year he came in the room he said court he said I don't know how you've made it this far he goes I have no idea how you walked into here he goes the chances of you being paralyzed after the surgery are very high he goes we're going to do our best and so I remember waking up and I remember um I remember having feeling in my legs, which was um, incredible. And but I remember being in a hospital bed. I, I this is my seventh surgery in in twelve months at that point. Mm. And I remember being in a hospital bed by myself, no family, in Washington D.C., having just moved to San Diego two weeks before. Going, how did I get here? And uh, that was my bottom. God, that's crazy, isn't it? Absolutely yeah, crazy. That was my bottom. Well, both of you, and obviously any surgery, anything dealing with the spine is is, uh, is not a great, uh, not great part of the body comes with a, a hell of a lot of high risk. So you both went through this more extreme adversity than, than anyone should have to go through in a lifetime as well, where of course these ho- moments of hopelessness and despair, I mean, even with the support of other people, there's only so much that other people can do. This is, this is still very much uh, a personal battle because it's happened to you two individually but what happened that moment from that extreme darkness that moment when you decided to say you know what despite what these doctors say because you've both had that you've both been given this those moments where 
uh, in your own way where it's like the doctors have said you have a certain amount of time to live or you shouldn't be doing that and you shouldn't be walking. Um, you shouldn't have been walking in and Janine shouldn't have been walking at all. I mean, these are the these moments where, again, anyone in that situation is completely justified to say, you know what, that's, that's me. I'm going to sort of see out my days, uh, which is another... Uh, common element that happened with the Jim Stovall story when he was told that he would go blind and once that happened that mm. he should see out his days in a closed room uh, be, where he would be safe. It's like all these people they're trying to say that you will uh, you will be safe and obviously they're covering their own their own things as well which is another debate around healthcare and, and medicine and liability for the for the medical industry. But what was that moment after this rock bottom? So we covered the rock bottom. When was that defining moment where you decided to stand tall and, you know, despite seemingly well-informed medical opinions? Gosh, to me, it's all about, you know, control and surrender. You know, we often think that we know how, you know, we know how things are best, you know, let me organize it, you know, and, um, you know, I love that expression, you know, that, um, you know, God has a sense of humor when you say, you know, don't worry, let me organize it. And he says, all right, you know, fine. <laughs> um, you know, because I always thought that I was in control. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an athlete. Um, you know, I've, I've got it all organized. And, you know, I thought I couldn't live without sport. I mean, we've, you know, Court and I have talked about this too, being athletes. I mean, I think I lost the one thing that defined who I was. And I always say to people, you know, we it's very easy in life to define ourselves by things that are outside of us. And if you do, you're on a slippery slope because, you know, eventually we're going to lose all of those things. You know, there's only one thing we can't lose, and that is who we are, the essence of who we are inside, the defiant human spirit, as I say. So for me, it was, um, you know, I lost the thing that defined who I was, an athlete, and that was the one thing that was going to wake me up. You know, because I thought I was my body. You know, I, I, that's how I put myself out in the world. The powerful body that you'd been yeah. heralded and acclaimed for, you know, for many years at that point as yeah. well, having all the qualifying for the Winter Olympics and things. Yeah, and I mean, my, that, my whole life since I was six or seven, I'd been a competitive athlete, national level in Australia. And so, you know, I lost that, that one thing. And I think these moments are... And I'm sure, Court, you'll agree with me. These are the defining moments in life. These are the ones that really show us who we are and what we're capable of. And I, I always say that every experience is an invitation. And this is, this is an invitation. It's more than that. It's a provocation. It's life saying, you know, okay, are you ready to take the hero's journey, hmm. which everybody is on, you know, and I say that this hero's journey is not optional, it's compulsory, and you can refuse the call, you know, I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell's work, The Hero's Journey, so you can refuse the call, but sooner or later it's going to come back, and it's going to get you and tap you on the shoulder and say, okay, you're ready now, and, you know, it's usually the thing that you fear the most, it's usually the thing that you fear losing the most that is the thing that will wake you up. God, I love that. Are you ready to take the hero's journey? So uh, well, you've got to so step powerful. on the path. And, yeah, and, and it's when you do say yes to that experience, and I, I think we were talking about this earlier. Courtney, we were saying, you know, that to me, it's about accepting all of life, the painful and the magnificent. And so you can't sort of cherry pick. You can't say, well, I'm only going to take the good bits. No, you know, we're in this human experience. We've got to take it all. And for me, when I let go of my agenda and how I thought my life was supposed to look. That's the moment that everything in my life changed. Incredible. In a, in a dramatic and remarkable way, I yeah. can say. Janine is also a professional speaker, so good luck following that, Court. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say what she said? <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about you, Court? I mean, Point for real. You've, 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 uh, what I, you know, I feel like Court immediately touches people because he has this... You know, the mission that you're on right now with so much uncertainty, I mean, you've gone to Houston to do the TED Talk uh, when and you're here doing all these things to try and create this movement. You've got this docu-series you want to create. You've been trying to do crowd funds, all these trying to really harness people, the real power of the mastermind, harness people in a coordinated effort towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. That's what you've been doing rather than dwelling on everything that's wrong. It's like uh, Janine and I were talking earlier today about Carol Dweck, everything she talks about, mm -hmm. the difference between the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. 
And the definition of the growth mindset really is how you respond to adversity when it inevitably strikes. That's what separates ordinary people from extraordinary achievers as well. So Court, you have done an amazing job. Of course, after that rock bottom moment, what was what was the transition? I know the TED Talk was such a powerful uh, personal victory for you. What was the moment when you felt like, I'm going to stand tall and move forward despite everything that the doctors were saying? Well, what you said was, was, was I mean, it really hit me in the fact that um, my, da- my lowest moment Uh, My highest moment, probably the moment that you're talking of happened really close to my lowest moment where I was in the hospital and this had been my, like I said, a six or seven surgery. I can't even keep track. And I said to myself, okay, I am clearly paddling upstream. Like I'm paddling against the current, right? And I literally had this like kind of just spiritual feeling of saying to myself, okay, it's time to paddle downstream. It's time to allow this all to happen. And, you know, Janine, you and I were just talking. I, I know what happened to me. I was living a life that wasn't me. It wasn't my values. It wasn't my purpose. Hmm. And pre-diagnosis, and, you mean? Pre-diagnosis. Yeah. And everything was shedding. And life was just saying, this is not you. We're going we're gonna to tap you on the shoulder until you realize this is not you. And we're going to keep on tapping you on the shoulder until you re- realize this is not you. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in that hospital bed and I'm like, all those things I thought was me... Hmm was not really me. Mm. It, they didn't really define me. And just like you said, Janine, you thought your body defined you. And yours happened when you were younger. You were in your mm. 20s, oh, which is yeah. much more, it's much difficult, more difficult. Well, I think it's all, you know, it's all difficult, but life has a way of finding the one thing. It's like, you, yeah. you know, you're the one thing that's going to wake you up. Absolutely. Um, you're that trigger point and... For me, it was my body. Yeah. For you, it was your purpose and your mission, and absolutely waking you up. It's just it's remarkable. You know, we get everything that we need. Yeah, yeah. Not, not necessarily everything we want. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. certainly what we need. And so much of that is just that journey of, of finding your true self. And if mm. you if you neglect it, as Court and Jean have saying, the universe has an amazing knack of being able to hit you like a lightning absolutely. bolt to accelerate that mm. journey to, to finding your uh, your true self. And the ones that don't will inevitably be forced to succumb to misery or whatever it might be you know we see these people trying to fit in with other people doing uh things that might necessarily be in their best interest long term to appease the the short-term crowd uh but eventually there will be circumstances presented to you which will provide a i guess like a yellow brick road to step into to being your true self i certainly am i'm experiencing that right now i literally have brick by brick happening as i walk through this life right now yeah it's literally what's happening shedding the skin yeah and you know we suffer when we hold on to things too tightly and you know i have a lot of people say to me oh you know i i i fear losing x y and z you know i'm an athlete i can't imagine what i'd do if i couldn't play my sport anymore I you know I'm a musician if I can't play my instrument and you know when we hold on really tightly to things we suffer and I say well life is about loosening our grip because sooner or later we're going to let go of all of those things and what's really fascinating for me about my journey is that I thought I could never live without my sport because I was an elite athlete yeah and I discovered that actually not only can I not live without it, but I can thrive and create an extraordinary life. And it wasn't until I let go um, of how I thought my life was supposed to look that I could embrace, you know, a totally different life, which was, you know, becoming a, a pilot, learning to fly, becoming an aerobatic pilot, I, I, which I'd never wanted to do ever in my life before. But, you know, sometimes we just, we, we have to get out of our way. Absolutely. We actually have a question now that's coming uh, through on the live. So, Crystal, hey, Crystal, hope you're doing well. Uh, question for both of you. What do you do when you're feeling down? Do you have a routine or a particular activity that you use to help you get your rhythm back? Well, I have a lot of routines. You know, I'm a big fan um, of uh, gratitude practices, um, so I always give thanks. I know that, um, you know, an interesting fact for anyone out there is um, we know that gratitude changes our brains and it's not, you actually just asking the question, what am I grateful for, actually reduces, uh, re- sorry, releases neurotransmitters in the mm-hmm. brain, dopamine and serotonin, very similar to what antidepressants do. So just asking the question and what neuroscience is telling us now that you don't actually have to find the thing. It's actually the search itself that starts this chemical process in the brain. So, you know, what am I grateful for is a, an amazingly powerful way 
to shift your mood. Um, that's one one thing I do. I've got many more. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I actually gratitude has been has been huge for me as well. Like I know that Berkeley released a study in the last couple of years. It talks about how. Uh, physiologically proven to help make people happier and less depressed as well. So mm-hmm. for anyone who is interested in starting gratitude, the five minute journal by uh, the author is called the intelligent change. The five minute journal by the intelligent change is a phenomenal way uh, that you can use to start a daily gratitude practice. Cause I feel like staring at a blank page is very, very daunting for a lot of people, myself included. So you write down three things uh, that would make today great. And oh, sorry, you start off by writing three things that you're grateful for and three things that would make today a win. And then you write down a positive affirmation. And then before you go to bed, you write down three amazing things that happened that day and what you could have done to improve the day. And I do that most of the time. And it's funny that when I go to write down what I could have done to improve the day, in about 90% of cases, I always write, or I write mm. today was a good day because it really does help put things uh, into perspective as well. So the five minute journal, if you want to start a gratitude practice, uh, mm. is a great one. Court, what about you? Well, sorry. And you know, and there's just one final thing about gratitude is that um, give thanks for the tangibles and the intangibles. So not just things, but opportunities, for example. If you have an opportunity, that's something to be grateful for. And the other thing is to, what's really important is to actually not just say it out aloud and make it a, you know, um, you know, rote thing, but actually feel it and create that change in your body. Because what we know now is that we need to actually create the feeling to create that, the, the actual neural pathways and the change in our brains, thanks to neuroplasticity. Yeah, absolutely. Which charges the emotions, which is going to make you more resourceful and resilient along your journey as well. Great call. Cool. So um, the book, The Magic... By Rhonda Byrne. Have you heard of it? No, I know. Rhonda Byrne did The Secret. The Secret. Yeah. Secret. So The Magic is, I feel like, her best book, and not many people mm-hmm. know about it, and it's the book that I've gifted to more people than any other book, and it's about this gratitude practice. Mm-hmm. She takes you through an entire month, 30 days, of writing 10 things you're grateful for every day. That book changed my life. Love it. Absolutely. Wow. Proof is in the pudding. Yeah, it was, a, it was an <laughs> awesome book, but um, for me, it's meditation for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as you were saying before, and as you were saying as well... Depression is low brain activity, anxiety is high brain activity. When we're feeling down, what we tend to do is we tend to think about why we're feeling down. We tend to try to solve the problem. But going into silence, I feel, and not that I feel, it's it's both experiential and scientific, is that when you go into silence, you start to forget about all the things you're attached to. We get, you know, the down feelings that we get, especially in our day and age, is is our overwhelm. It's our attachment to things. It's where we think we should be. We're always saying we should be somewhere else. It's our story. Exactly. Yeah. And so meditation has been huge for me. And and so, you know, whether it's just closing your eyes for five, 10 minutes, meditation can be overwhelming to a lot of people. I mean, can you, can you, uh, can you let us know what type of meditation sure, you're doing to sure. for people who maybe have never tried meditation sure. before? So, so I do Joe Dispenza's meditations, which are lengthy. I, I meditate probably three hours a day, which seems like a lot, but I'm going through something pretty significant. So you don't need to start there. Uh, there are great uh, apps like Headspace and Calm where you can do five minute, 10 minute guided meditations, transcendental meditation. Uh, which is a mantra-based meditation uh, as well. What's that, 15 or 20 minutes? I do. It depends. What, you know, if I'm traveling, I might do a short meditation. Sure. But, um, you know, I like to do maybe 30 minutes in yeah. the morning, 30 minutes sure. at night. Sure. I, I do TM. I have a mantra-based meditation sure. practice. And so there's a lot of great ways to meditate. Uh, from the TED Talk that I did, though, probably the most significant takeaway was uh, the Benson Henry Institute out of uh, MGH uh, in uh, Harvard. That's Harvard Affiliated Hospital. Uh, they did. Uh, they took 20 people and they took them through um, eight weeks of meditation. They had never meditated before, and they measured their gene expression on day one and then on the uh, end of the eight weeks. And they found out that meditating for just that short period of time changed 1,500 genes in the human body. Wow! So 1,500 genes were changed by meditating for eight weeks. And by the way, they were meditating for 15 minutes a day. Yeah. That's so it. if you feel like hope is lost, there of course is. I mean, you hear it from these two as well. Actually, one one form of meditation which is uh, excellent for entrepreneurs is a Japanese meditation called Zazen as well, where you kneel and you sit there watching a flickering flame that you put in front of you uh, close to you. The idea of that 
is is focus and then the byproduct of that is presence and then relaxation yeah. as well that's something which you can start off with doing two minutes a day and gradually increase your time it's going to be a big goal of mine actually for the next few months to get back on track with that i was i was great with that for a while and i absolutely i absolutely loved it uh so Insight thank you time is another great app on the phone you know the Insight oh, cool. timer and for people yeah. that that ne- might not necessarily have you know um the time or the exactly. patience to sit there and just uh, you know meditate with a mantra. They have lots of guided meditations there. You can do ten minutes. I mean, it's and I think for, for me the benefit of meditating is um, I've got a very busy mind. Um, dropping the story. I think a lot of the anxiety that we create in life is we create a story around something. And um, I'll give you an example. Do you want to hear something that happened to me today? Absolutely. This is just something today. So I was driving across LA and the traffic was really bad. And you know when you get to those, you know you get to those set of lights where they have the, um, you know, the red light and you have one car at a time can go and everyone yep. lines up and they're very polite. People in, in Los Angeles are very polite. So I'm lined up behind a car, and the light goes green and someone goes and I move forward and the light goes green. And just before I took off, this car sped past me and took my spot. Now, I created a story, and I said, that is so rude. What a rude person. And all of a sudden, I thought to myself, I love to refrain. And I thought, what if that person had just been given the news that their child is in the hospital, and they need to get there as quickly as possible? How different would you feel towards that car? And I thought, I would feel completely compassionate and empathic. And so that's an example of how we create stories around things, you know, and we know that road rage, you know what it's like. And suddenly I felt this, whew. Yeah, going you know, from wanting to rip their head off you know, all from, of a sudden. Yeah, feeling angry. I thought. <laughs> and so, I mean, we can do that all the time. You know, every time we're feeling angry, we say, well, what's another story? Yeah. What's another version of that? And that's, uh, you know, a lot of our problems are that we're creating stories around things. And when we drop the story, you'll know in meditation, right. you know, we get a chance to drop the story and just be present. Become present. I yeah. was just going to say that. And when, Experience presence. For sure. And when you have those moments where it might be something in a situation that might stress you out, just closing your eyes and spending a minute to think about well, what is the energy that you want to bring into that situation and what is the outcome that you want to get out of that situation as well And that uh, situation that Janine was just talking about. Uh, road rage, obviously it's a quick one if some dickhead cuts you off in, uh, in traffic, which of course happens all too frequently. All that's going to happen by you dwelling on that situation is it's going to rob you of your happiness in the future for 10, 20 minutes, maybe even the whole day. It could be a hell of a lot worse depending on what's going on. But a simple reframe to say that let's provide, maybe if it's an imaginary context, just to release yourself from future stress as a result means you can get along with your day and and move forward happy. Uh, Anyone else, if you've got any questions right now, just drop it in uh, to the comments as well and we'll answer them as best we can. Uh, Brandon, if you've got any comments about road rage, you can drop that in here as well. (laughs) Uh, Janine, so the phrase that you talk about in all your keynotes and your books and things as well, it's it's probably my favorite of yours. It was during that uh, very difficult moment in your life where you couldn't walk and you said to yourself, if I can't walk, I'll fly. Can you share a little bit about what that phrase means and how people can apply it in their own lives? If I can't walk, I'll fly. Well, for me, obviously, you know, I was sitting at home in a wheelchair, plaster cast, you know, thinking, well, what am I going to do with my life? My life as an athlete, my whole life revolved around sport. And it was only, I only got to that point when I'd been through the dark, you know, the dark night of the soul on the ground, when I said that prayer, when I cried out, show me a way through or show me a way out. And I literally let go. That was the point of surrender where I said, okay, all right, life, bring it on. What am I going to do with this life? And that was when, you know, one of my um, favorite quotes is Marcel Proust, who says, the journey of discovery is not seeking new landscapes, it's in having new eyes. And I think for me, that's what that moment was for me. It was like, all right, well, if I can't do that, then I'll do that. And, you know, it was about reinvention. It was about rediscovery. And, you know, Would you mind just repeating that quote again? Uh, yeah, Marcel like Proust really said, uh, the journey of discovery is not seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. God, that's powerful. And you really have to let go of how you think your life is supposed to look before life will give you the opportunities. And I think, you know, once you do let go and surrender, that's really when you get new eyes. That's when possibilities abound. And, you know, for me learning to fly the first time. I mean, I was in a wheelchair. Everyone thought I was crazy. You know, I was lifted into an airplane. 
um, people thought, you, you know, really, are you serious? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you're trying to use a catheter and you want to go and become a pilot. This is the you airport, know? this is the airport, yeah, not the so hospital. That... <laughs> I had no idea, you know, I went for that first flight. And of course, I, I always said that flying was just this incredible, magical um, journey. I bet everyone out there wants to learn to fly. You know, not only just becoming, you know, a private pilot, I went on and became a commercial pilot, an aerobatics flying instructor, and there's a long story behind all of that. But it really opened my eyes to, you know, the fact that we do have to surrender to life. We do have to accept. I mean, acceptance, I'm a big fan of acceptance. And um, whatever you're going through at home, if you're struggling right now, the first step that you need to go through is acceptance. And acceptance is not resignation acceptance is actually being able to say okay so this has happened so now what and that's when the magic really starts to happen and when you when you talk about surrender as well you're talking about surrender in a good way aren't you because we often think about surrender in a negative context but what Janine you're talking about is surrendering all in a way that it's what Court has been talking about as well. All of these different decisions you make from the hundreds of forks in the road we're faced with each day is about freeing yourself up that you can make the decision that's going to get you closer to your true self. Is that right? Yeah, it's about saying yes to life. I mean, that's what we're here for. Life is actually giving us an invitation. Life is giving us an opportunity to say yes to all of life, all of the experiences. And I know we talked about this earlier, Court. I said, you know, when you've been at, you know, rock bottom, everything else is just magical. You know, you get, it's just, um, you have this incredible love and appreciation for life. It's shedding your skin. It's um, seeing with new eyes. And, you know, we, to get to that point, life is, you know, giving us this invitation to accept and surrender. I it's love it. power. We've got a question from uh, from Brandon Adams as well, good friend of all hey, of us Brandon. here. <laughs> um, hey, Brandon. What's up, buddy? He, he said, when you both face the temporary feeling of my life is over or when you literally face death, how did you look at life and your goals differently when it comes to making money, achieving goals, hmm. leisure time, etc.? You go. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that, um, I think that everything, everything I believed about success and goals and money changed. Success is, success is a completely different definition for me now. Uh, I'm on disability. I'm on, I'm on public health care. I don't work, you know, like, and I, and I honestly, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because I spend every day talking to people that need my help. People call me from all over the world now that have cancer. They're just like, we saw you on Facebook, we saw you on Instagram, we saw your TED Talk, and people reach out to me, and it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. And I'm moving in the direction of turning this into a business, but it's an, a business that's going to you know, serve a greater good. It's going to serve compassion. It's, um, it's coming from a place of fulfillment. I really, you know, I really knew that the old way that I was acting was... Um, wasn't really me. I was really absorbing probably the values of the people I grew up with and maybe my family. And uh, that's what, you know, cancer was that big thing that kind of just kept on tapping me on the shoulder and say, hey, this isn't, this isn't who you are. This isn't who you're you're meant to be. And so um, success, um, I don't really even like saying the word success anymore. It's more maybe achievement, you know, success is so monetarily connected. But success is so much more. I mean, uh, you know, Tony Robbins says it all the time. He says, um, the success without fulfillment, fulfillment is failure, right? And like that really hit hard for me because achieving success is easy, but being fulfilled about what you do that's the real challenge. And when you talk about a business, obviously any business, you need to have money and, and things yep. like that. Yep. Yep. A lot of people have a negative connotation with money as well. It's sure. a bit like the word surrender. But all that happens is if you have more money, it enables you, it gives you more freedom to contribute to the causes that you care about most. Absolutely. If court had, you know, hypothetically, just as a very, very extreme example, if you have $10 trillion, you can change the world for whatever you want. But if you've got Bring $1... On, <laughs> You've got one dollar. You can't even pay people to help you on that mission. So having the having financial means is actually a positive thing rather than a negative thing, which I feel like a lot of people uh, struggle with these days. Well, money's uh, just you know it's energy. 
You know, yeah. it's just everything's energy. But it's I feel like earning earn, information. Yeah, you know? I feel like earning it through something that you're really truly passionate mm. about is a, it's a different it's a different translation yeah. of energy. No, <laughs> right? absolutely. I think that, I think and the key to that is to have goals. When I say goals with soul, yeah, really. you want to make. For me, as an athlete, it was all about winning races, winning medals, getting to the Olympics. And now it's for me, it's all about being really aligned with why I'm here. You know, the difference between um, you know work and a job. You know, a job is what you do to earn money and your work is your calling, what you're here to do. And I think when you're really aligned with what you, your soul is here to do, the money will flow. Agreed. And, Agreed. you know, you just get this sense of it's intrinsic. You know, it's, it's no longer extrinsic. You know, you're not looking to measure yourself or your worth by things outside of you. Plus, you've got a pretty decent trophy cabinet right now. I'm sure you could sell if... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I threw all my stuff away. <laughs> but you're right. It's inevitable. Know. It's inevitable. Like I, feel like, I feel like what I'm building from my experiences, mm. there's inevitability of it, of it supporting my life because I'm so excited to help support thousands and thousands mm. of other people. So Cord is here talking about how he can add value to other people's lives and all money is is a product of the value that we're exactly. able to create in the marketplace as well. So uh, great question and even better answers as well. Uh, all right, Court, what did it feel like when you, you did your TED Talk in Houston recently? What did it feel like going from that moment where you had all these you know, extreme things going on to all of a sudden being up on stage at Houston on a day where physically, of course, like most people find it extremely daunting to be up on stage anyway for anxiety and, and worrying about what other people think and everything else. But all of a sudden, you're up there on stage in front of all these people. You're having those normal emotions, only you've got all of the physical symptoms to deal with as well. What was that moment and how did it feel like it changed your life as a result of doing the TED Talk? Well, because I surrendered... Yeah, because I, it's not everyone's number one fear, right? Yeah. Public speaking. Well, not not for me. Like, the, <laughs> like, like, so I, so because I surrendered, yeah. it was, it was obvious that it came to me. It wasn't like a surprise. I was standing, and again, this, this, it, it's really hard to explain if you're not going through this, right? Because there's a point in your life where things just start to flow. Like for you, when you told me, like. You, you left one podcast and you're like, I'm going to do, what, 100 podcasts this year? 100 podcasts in a year was the goal. And you did, what, 200 something? Yeah. Yeah, it, again, it, it, so I stood up on that TED stage and I was like, I belong here. I'm supposed to be here. The tough part was that, you know, it was a 7 a.m. start and I remember that, like, mornings are pretty tough for me and, and physically I was in real rough shape that day. I was nauseous. I was, um, you know, my spine was killing me and I literally just, just said, okay intuition I just asked my I closed my eyes I asked my body I said you know this talk you've got this and I literally do not remember a moment of being on that stage because it was like this it just happened I walked off people were in tears and I was like I think I did it yeah they're good tears or bad tears? <laughs> yeah, good tears good tears good tears that's uh that's fantastic absolutely amazing and it should give inspiration as all of these lessons should for anyone right there who's figuring out uh, trying to muster the courage to achieve something in their own life there becomes a part of your life hopefully you're connecting the dots of all these things to help figure out a way forward for all these these different things and Janine, when did you, you do your TED Talk? What was the year? Oh, gosh, I did 2012. Um, 2012? So seven, seven years now, and it's been, you know, it's it's been just an incredible blessing. Um, like you, it's just a magical experience, and I gave mine in Kansas City, um, thousands of people in the audience, and it was just, yeah, I, it's almost a bit of a blur um, as well. It was um, a very special moment in my life, and I think... You know, afterwards, like you caught, I mean, I, I still get letters from all over the world, people listening to my talk. And one that really stands out to me was from um, a man in India wrote to me and said, you know, I've had an ailment for 17 years and it was so bad that I was considering suicide. He said, but I saw your talk today wow. and my life starts now. Wow. So pray for me. Wow. Um, I have hope. And I, that's the TED platform. I mean, it's wow. incredibly powerful. And I just feel grateful that it's given me and others like Court um, an opportunity to share a story for people that might not get the opportunity to hear it. For sure. Uh well, you've now, so the TED Talk's got more than 2 million views just, I think, on, on YouTube or on the TED platform, let alone all the other ones. Yeah. The videos at Goldcast and all the other sites have put forward, you've got probably almost a billion views. It's certainly at least five, 600 million yeah. views on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube right now, too. 
How does it feel to be, you know, when you receive those emails and how has your life changed as a result of knowing that there are millions and millions and millions of people around the world that privately reach out for you and you are able to help these people as a result of what was an extremely traumatic experience for you but continues to create meaning in your life? I, well, I'm sure you'll agree, Court. I mean, I feel incredibly grateful and blessed that I've been given this opportunity. I, I feel that I'm carrying a message. Um, I think that my story, you know, I always say that whenever I stand on stage, I'm holding up a mirror so that other people can see their story um, in mine um, and see what they're capable of. I say that we're all, you know, the defiant human spirit and it's not something that we have it's something that we are and we're all capable of extraordinary things when we let go of the stories that we think define us so um it's been yeah the ted platform has been incredibly um you know a gift for me to be able to share my story i love it uh, we got a question from Tim all the way in sunny, Queen hopefully sunny Queensland. I hear it's a very hot Queensland right now in Australia. <laughs> uh, what are your favourite accomplishments other than the obvious... Her- Sorry, let me start that again. What is your... Uh, the camera's a little while away, so forgive yeah. me here. What is your favourite accomplishments other than the obvious hurdles you have overcome in life? So obviously you've gone through these things and, and you're on a, a positive mm-hmm. path and mission right now, each of you. What do you regard as your biggest accomplishments uh, to date? For me, that's really easy, having three kids. Especially after being yeah. told you. you yeah, they said it. I wouldn't have kids because of the extent of my internal injuries, and I've got three absolutely beautiful children. And, yeah, I, I just loved and do love being a mother, so really, really proud of that. Love it. That's a good one. What are – wow, that's a tough one. I think um, – you know, this may sound crazy, but the fact that I'm still here is an accomplishment. <laughs> That's a huge one. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, when I was seven years old, I touched the power line and I was electrocuted and I almost died then. And I've broken probably 20 bones in my life and I uh, am going through this. And what's really interesting is to look back, you and I, you and I were talking about this, how you have a high pain threshold. So yeah. do I. <laughs> and I'm looking, I was looking back at all the things that went, went through my life and I was like, I've had 50 IVs this year, right? It's like, that's nothing. What's a needle in my arm? But I feel like all of those moments prepared me for what I'm going through right now. And so I look back at myself and um, I listen to that song, uh, See is uh, Unstoppable, because I, I feel unstoppable. And that's kind of like what I, what, I, uh, what I continuously tell myself. But I think my biggest accomplishment is that I've, you know, overcome all these obstacles. Fantastic. And, and you have referred to yourself as a cancer thriver as sure. well. I love that. That's yeah. fantastic. Rather than using words like victim, um, survivor, you know. Patient. Patient. Yeah. Uh, dozens and dozens of other ones. What does it mean, uh, the difference, when people call themselves a call themselves a thriver versus something like a victim or patient, given what we know and, of course, what you talk about, or all three of us talk about, yeah. about the power of the mind? Yeah. So... Um, there's a really cool Tony Robbins uh, uh, thing that he does, and he uh, he goes he goes close your eyes, picture what a seventy year old man looks like, right? And, and then seventy year a seven year old man looks like, mm-hmm. right? And then he says, open your eyes, and there's a guy in stage who's jacked and can bench four hundred pounds, and he's seventy years old, right? Is that the guy that you were picturing in your mind, right? And so when you say cancer patient or cancer victim, and you say cancer thriver. What do you picture in those things? If you close your eyes and picture victim or patient, it's a totally different visual than a thriver. Hospital right? bed, sickly, exactly. Title. Yeah. And so, victim, patient, you picture someone with no hair, which I might someday have no hair, and I might someday have to go through that. But I feel like it's just a way of saying, why do we have to be that? Why do we, Why do we have to be that person, that identity, while going through cancer? We could be this identity while going through cancer. I'm still going through the pain and it's still challenging, but I don't need to live with the identity of being a victim or a patient, Mm -hmm. you know? God, I love it. For me, it's about taking responsibility. You know, I I say that what's really important in life is to say, to own life. You know, that's such an important part of a resilient mindset. And uh, it's for me, for example, um, part of taking responsibility was forgiving the, the man that ran me over who was charged with negligent driving, and he got an $80 fine. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> Sorry, so, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, you know, um, and so a real lesson there for me was to be able to forgive him. And, the, you know, I, I come across a lot of people who who blame and hate and give away their power because unless we're going to say, okay, I own my life, we're giving away our power and we can never actually make, you know, change in our lives. Stephen Covey, the great author, author says that, responsibility and change are like two ends of a stick so you know when you take responsibility you pick up the other side too and you're able to change your life and so for me I got to this point where I actually wrote him a letter I didn't have his address I wrote him a letter of all the things that I was going through and I posted it right and that was just an exercise in forgiveness and I realized that I couldn't change the past but what I could change was the you know everything that happened from this point on so for me a big one was just you know, being responsible. You can't change what happened to you, but you can change how you respond to it. Wow, absolutely. Now, there's one question I want to ask each of you as well, which is a really, really powerful question, or I think you'll have some powerful answers for it, rather. You've both had these experiences that have brought you close to death. What has that taught you about life? Hmm. 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 Okay, I'll take that. Uh... I, again, I, I, Janine and I, we, we've, we've covered a lot in like yeah, the, yeah, in the 30 minutes that we're talking <laughs> down there. But I think that uh, the, the conversation about death is so interesting in our society because we just, we hide from it. And all of a sudden one day the doctor sits you down and says you have three years to live and all of a sudden your mortality is, you know, your mortality is way off in the distance and you can't see it right. And all of a sudden it's right here in your face. Yeah. And so that changes a lot of things. And so... I feel like the biggest lesson from that is that I, we're all so ingrainedly fearful of death, mm. right? And so I think, that, I think that I have felt more alive in the last two years since my di- diagnosis than I ever have before. So think about that. It's almost as if the thought of death has forced me to go, you better start living, you know? Mm. Do you think people fear death? the most who haven't lived their life the fullest or do you think there's no correlation i think there could be a correlation to that absolutely fear not living yeah Yeah. 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 i agree i agree what about you janine what has your near-death experience taught you about life i always say that i didn't have a near-death experience i say i had a death experience um, because i you know i left my body and i had you know those uh, for 10 days i made this you know I, I didn't want to come back to my body I remember looking at my body and thinking I'm, I don't want to go back there I'm an athlete that's that body's second rate <laughs> it's broken can't serve me anymore so and people often ask me about that experience you know what's on the other side and what was that experience like and I said well actually I, I didn't come back to share that experience what I came back was to share this experience how to live and I think that's the more important takeaway from what I've been through is that, you know, don't worry about what's going to happen when you die. Worry about what's happening now, this moment. Are you truly living? It's a small you know, twist to say, but it's a huge shift mentally, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. very powerful. And I think, you know, and I, I bet, Court, you'd agree with this. It's such a short time. We're here for such a short time. So savor every single moment and make it count. You live, live as if every moment counts because every moment does. I love it. What about now, and I know we've covered a lot of these already, but when we talk about resilience, Janine, you've got your School of Resilience and things uh, being launched at the moment. And of course, Court, you just keep learning more and more about resilience from, from going through all this stuff because as they say, experience is not the best teacher, it's the only teacher. What are the the lessons, the strategies to overcoming adversity and forging resilience that anyone can apply in in their life, whoever wants to take it? Forging resilience. Wow. That's a tough one. Uh, You know, I think... uh, So I think think something that's come out of just this conversation that I realized, and that's the fact that uh, your bottom is so close to your top meaning or 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 getting to the point when you're going from that you know the valley to the peak right just like reading your story and going from being in the hospital bed to being you know getting your flight license right like for me being in bed and then deciding i'm 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 not going to paddle upstream anymore i'm going to paddle downstream what we do 
is we have this assumption that life is supposed to be perfect and we're not supposed to experience depression, anxiety, fear, you know, shame, guilt, all these things, right? We feel like if we're experiencing those things, we're broken. But on the flip side of the coin is that what if those things were helping you to get to the point where you needed to get to? Mm. You know, what if you're asking that question? And again, you guys kind of alluded to this, but I always ask this. I always ask this question to myself in every conversation. I said, am I using a judging mindset or am I using a learning mindset? Okay. Am I being a judger or am I being a learner? In every single situation that I could possibly be in, we judge. By the way, the logic brain was built to judge and it was built to judge to survive. Mm. We judge to survive. We look at someone and we go, that person's less than me. I'm more than them. I am going to survive better than that. That's, that's a biological program that we have. And we have to overcome that program that we have, right? So judging is normal, but you want to continuously get out of that judging mindset and get into that learning mindset. But again, I think the biggest thing is that is that in when you're feeling the most down, when you're feeling like you're at the bottom, you are so close. Like you're really, truly so close. And by the way... You know, we talk about suicide before. Mm. This is the thing is that these, we've, we've, we've lost so many great artists in the past couple of years, right? Like, you know, like Chris Cornell comes to mind, like mm. who was, his voice was angelic. And, and, and this man looked in the mirror and he had kids and a family. And he literally said to himself, my family's better off without me. Same as Chester from Lincoln Park. Exactly. Well. And they were good yeah. friends. Mm. And so, and so, you know, I don't think... I do think there's mental illness, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that you know they were lesser men to co- commit suicide, but what's interesting is that the beauty that came after that down thing could have been you know astronomical. Mm-hmm. And, and you know who am I to say that in the fact that I, I haven't experienced that? But what I'm saying is, is, is I truly believe that you know your peak or, or your high point or getting to a high point is really close to when you hit rock bottom. I feel like I feel like most people have to hit rock bottom to live their true purpose and their true values in life. What does they say? It's darkest before the dawn. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What about you, Janine? Do you want to talk a little bit about well, your school I, of resilience yes. and maybe one or two, pil- yes. three or four, however many pillars you want to talk well, yeah. about from the 12? Is that well, right? I've, yeah, I've created uh, the school for resilience and 12 pillars and there'll be a course lo- uh, launching early next year. I think ever since you know I had my accident, I've been fascinated in, in the whole... Um, you know, process of resilience. Why is it that two people can go through the same experience and one person can thrive and one person, you know, falls apart? So, you know, my background was in sports science and, you know, it was all about learning about the body, how to be the best, most elite athlete I could be. And, of course, after my accident, you know, I switched my focus to the brain. How do I become the most resilient person I can be? You know, so I sort of dived into everything from neuroplasticity to positive psychology, um anything I could do to really learn about how I did what I did. And I put that together in a course. Isn't that amazing? I I love that because you went through it and then it's almost like a reality check of, what did I just do? Now it's to be able to provide some structure so you can replicate that to help other people. Yes, well, it's all science-based. You know, most of the the 12 pillars are, you know, Science based, and they go from everything from, of course, the first pillar is acceptance, and the last one's actually gratitude. And but okay. it's very artistic, too, it's, at the same time. It's art, it's your yeah, art, it's it is your art. living art. Yeah, it is. And thank you. It's your living painting <laughs> um, that you've, you've yeah. literally created this, this beautiful tapestry. Yeah, no, and I'm really, really, um, I love it. It's it's sort of my life's work now, everything that I've learned through my life. And I take people through, you know, this process of the 12 pillars. It's and I, you know, it's almost like the past, the present, and the future. And there'll be exercises in that. And really, the idea about resilience and what I've learned is not just from my accident, but I've been through some major experiences. Like um, I've been through, like many people, divorce and being a single parent for 10 years, losing my house. And, you know, all of these things, what I've learned is that resilience is fluid. And the skills and the tools that I needed at one point in my life were different later on. So, you know, we're always learning. We're always changing. The brain is plastic. Well, you know, in, in terms of um, it's not stuck. Once upon a time, we thought that the brain, you know, stopped learning at a certain time. And now what science tells us is the brain is plastic and we're always learning and we learn through experience. So if we want a different experience of life, we have to do things differently. So, you know, that's what I do. I teach people how to hack their brain to create change for well-being. 
and um, you know one of the best one of the things I love most about Defiant which is Janine's book which Tim recently commented in the Win the Day group was the best book he's read of the last uh, 12 months is an absolutely phenomenal read Go and buy uh, Defiant from Janine Shepard. But one of the things I love in that is that the the ending of the story wasn't after the accident. The ending of the story encapsulated so many things. I mean, going through the the, the global financial crisis and what happened with your house and, and, you know, the marriage breakdown and all the different things. It's like every single day you might be faced with extreme adversity tomorrow that we don't know about. But how are we going to respond to that, you need to apply all these things that you two have been talking about Absolutely. to help get through that and thrive and be able to help others. And I've been pushed out of my comfort zone so many times, and I realize that things that have happened to me, as I said earlier, you know, that I haven't necessarily wanted, but I've needed. So, for example, you know, when I lost my house in Australia in the global financial crisis, which was devastating for me. Um, I, you know, I learned that um, my first, my TED talk was actually entitled "You're Not Your Body." I also learned that I'm also not my house, <laughs> and uh, you know that I had so many incredible things that I was grateful for, and that I could start again. I'd done it so many times before; it was second nature for me to just pick myself up and go. You know, I'm going to recreate my life once again. And if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have moved to America and all the incredible opportunities that have happened over here and um, how my life has unfolded. So, you know, sometimes we fight against things and um, life sort of says, hey, you know, come along for the ride. And I see life as this incredible adventure now. You know, and and we should all be going woohoo! <laughs> and it's a, it's a trap that people fall into, right? When they a lot of people they want to have, click the fingers and have a magic bullet. They want to buy a something for their mm-hmm. thinking that their life will be perfect now and forever in the future. It just doesn't it just doesn't work like that. But through all these mm-hmm. things, like a gratitude practice and being respectful and aware of your relationships and figuring out where you want to go and how you're going to do that and how you can help empower others. Uh, it's just a and great what you want your form. life to stand for, that's a really important thing because I know that a lot of people out there are going to be thinking about their goals. And we live in a very goal-orientated society, and that's great. But what we're missing is to be a values-orientated society. So I always say, you know, one of the pillars is values. Um, so it's all about working out, um, you know, what are my top, say, six values? What sort of a person do I want to be? Hmm. What do I want my life to stand for? So, yes, we need to set goals, but we also need to, you know, align those goals with our values. And that's where, that's how we really become motivated. Yeah. And anyone who's watching right now, if you've got a question, drop it in the comments. Even if you're watching a replay, just drop a question in the comments and I can uh, make sure I can get caught and Janine to go and uh, answer that later as well. What about your biggest inspirations along the way for this journey? Are there one or two people or books or anything that come to mind that, uh, that have been you know, a huge source of inspiration for each of you? For me, it's Joe Dispenza. Um, I, Janine, I was talking to you about mm. that. And he had, uh, Joe had a similar uh, accident to Janine. Uh, it was in uh, 19, uh, I think it was 88, he got hit by a truck in a triathlon in Palm Springs. Mm. And so um, Joe Dispenza, his, 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 he, he's like science and mysticism. And so, uh, you know, some people have some trouble with, you know, kind of getting into that side of science. But I say, you know, science is the, you know, science is the modern language of mysticism. So it's interesting. What we're doing in science is we're constantly proving mysticism. I mean, now quantum physics is becoming pretty standard in, in science. And so um, his meditations have really changed my life. What, it, what, what, I, what I really love about it is that just the pure understanding that we have the ability to get inside of our operating system by changing our brainwaves. And you were just talking about hacking your brain. And so, so through meditation, through breathing, there's a couple other things that you, that you can do it where you can actually get into your operating system, just like your daughter. Your daughter's a pure operating system right now because between the ages of zero to seven, you're literally purely absorbing information. You have no personality yet. At times, she has a very loud operating system. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Seven months old. Exactly. (laughs) And so she's constantly absorbing information, right? And she's creating that operating system, just like a computer. And so... We have these blocks that we have in our lives that could have happened, you know, this, this, this accident that I had when I was seven years old, it's something that like, when I talk about it still, I could still emotionally feel up my body. So it's was still, yeah. yeah, so it still affects me. And the way that um, a memory works is your body thinks it happened right now. Mm-hmm. Your body thinks it happened literally a moment ago. 
even though it happened 35 years ago. And so it can actually affect you from an autonomic nervous standpoint. It can put you into fight or flight, which is your sympathetic nervous system. And it could, for me, it's just you know the pedal to the metal and it's creating adrenaline endorphins. And what happens there is that when you have cancer or any other chronic disease, your body can't heal. And so what Joe teaches is how to put your body into homeostasis through meditation. And that has been... It's the most fascinating thing ever. Have you guys seen the movie Heal yet on, no, on Netflix? Seen it yet. So it's a Hay House movie, and I got to meet with um, one of the one of the guys that was in the movie yesterday, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. And what he does is he has figured out a way that there is a, a frequency in all human beings that when you find that frequency, you can put the headphones on, you can watch it, where it can take you from paras- uh, sympathetic state to homeostasis. So imagine, for instance... Um, uh, cancer patients, patients, cancer thrivers going into infusion centers and they're going into chemotherapy. Well, there's a lot of fear behind that. Could you guys imagine the fear going to that? Like you're literally going to this and you're seeing people who look like they're dying. I mean, it's a really, it's a really tough thing. And so what's going on is your autonomic nervous system is going crazy. It's literally going, no, don't go here. I can't accept this. I don't want this. And what it's doing is it's creating these stress hormones. Imagine if you were able to sit in those chairs and Either listen to a beat that that puts your body into homeostasis, or gets or do meditation. And so this is what this is really where I want to see cancer go and any chronic illness go is that we need to we need to it's scientifically scientific evidence that the medicine doesn't work as well if you're in a high state of stress mm. because your body is mobilizing all of those hormones to your appendages to fight or flight, and so. I just, you know, I'm really, I'm really super passionate about that. And, and Dispenza has really kind of put me down that, that road. That's great. So, yeah, I love it. What about you, Janine? One or two well, inspirations? The inspirational along the... people. Yeah, I mean, I can think of one, someone that most people would never have heard of. Of course, I did mention her in my TED Talk, and that's Maria. And uh, she was the girl that um, was next to me in a hospital bed. She had an accident, uh, woke up out of a coma on her 18th birthday to the news that um, she was a total quadriplegic and she would spend the rest of her life like that you know she had to have someone lift a straw up to her mouth we stayed in contact for her uh, her life and she passed a few years ago she was incredible wow. she always smiled she was always happy even though she had damage to her vocal cords as well I mean she was saintly as far as I'm concerned and she gave me the most incredible gift and that was the gift of acceptance because she the way she handled it with dignity and it was extraordinary, um, you know, and she really helped me move from why me to why not me because I always, you know, if I felt sorry for myself in hospital, all I had to do was to look in the bed next to me and there was Maria who was so much worse than me and always smiling. So, you know, if anyone wow. had a reason to not smile, it would be her. So, yeah. But, you know, she was a blessing to everyone that knew her, to her mm. family. Um, so, yeah, she was, she's probably the person that mm. I admire. That it's been my greatest inspiration. Mm. What about those people out there who want to succeed as an entrepreneur or in business and they they know that uh, having a great story is a really important part of that process, but they haven't been diagnosed with cancer or they haven't had an accident. Do you need to go through something like that to have a great story? What do you think? Well, someone asked me that the other day, actually, funnily enough, and I said, no, you, you don't, but it helps. Yeah, answer it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it only helps in the sense that, you know, when you've had something ripped, when you're at rock bottom, you really have a great opportunity to rethink what's important to you in life, and it's a wake-up call. So, but I think everyone, I really do believe that everyone has a story, mm. that everyone's been through tr- a traumatic experience of, of, of some degree, and everything can be used um, to wake us up. So I think the most important thing is to run your own race, be true to yourself and do what, you know, makes you feel alive. I mean, I can't imagine, um, you know, we live in a world that's, you know, we're often comparing ourselves to other people through Instagram or Facebook or something and thinking they've got it better than me. And let me tell you, they don't, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, it's, it's, you know, everyone's got a story, everyone's struggling. Um, So I think it's about just being, honoring your own journey. Love it. I think uh, I think I, I kind of echo what you say in the fact that um, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is someone that solves a problem they experienced. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what an entrepreneur is, right? I mean, it's every entrepreneur's gift is a problem or a challenge that they experience. That's that's what they br- they're bringing to the world, right? And so, 
what we do, as you said, is we compare ourselves. And there's there's probably people on here that are thinking to themselves, well, I don't have stories like this. You know, I'm not good enough, right? That's the biggest mistake because what you're doing in that case is you're living inside of our values and not your own values and experiences. And so use us as a catalyst, use us as motivation, but you got to live inside your own values. And that's what's amazing about humanity, right? Is that we all are different people. Everyone's different. And that's, you know, I, I've been talking about this in the cancer world for so long that, you know, they, they treat people in the cancer world and Western medicine as if you have lung cancer, this works for you. But, it, but, but now we're starting to get to the point where you have two people with lung cancer with the same blood type, the same age, and different medications work for each of them. Why? Mm. Because everyone is different. Mm. Because everyone has their own values. Because everyone has their own purpose, right? And so the biggest mm. thing you can do, goals are good, but as you said before, the most important thing, the higher than goals are what are your values and what, are, what is your purpose? Because you cannot have goals unless you have values or your purpose. Wow, I mean, you so want cool. goals, but you want goals with soul. Exactly, <laughs> goals yeah. with soul, and you get that from having values yeah, and a purpose. Absolutely. So true, and a lot of that comes to confidence as well. Like if you don't believe you have uh, a great story, you just need to have the right person to help uh, challenge to, to tease that out of you. Because I, I agree, I'm a firm believer that we all have an amazing story as well. Uh, last couple of questions before we finish up here. Uh, what's next for you two? What's the what's the movement to help inspire and, and change the world? Go ahead. Well, for me, it's finishing and launching this um, School for Resilience next year. So I'm just um, super excited about that, the course, and helping as many people as I can. Um, I think this is, you know, to me, it's... Um, this is a first in terms of resilience. It's it's a very soul, spiritual based course that's also backed by science. So I'm just really excited to bring, you know, something that I've studied for such a long time and, and also from my own personal experience um, and what I've been through. I'm just really excited to bring that into the world. Fantastic. For me, uh, wow, there's so much going on that's so exciting. It's 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 three things. It's a book. A summit and uh, a docu series, and so the book we're going to write with a hundred cancer thrivers. Yeah, and good. so my days right now are talking to people that have uh, incredible stories that have gotten through cancer, and it is literally the most inspiring thing in the world. And every single one of them, when I tell them that I want them in the book, they go, "If I had this when I was a cancer patient, this would be a game changer." And so. Um, we're doing a book and then we're going to do an online summit from there and we're having amazing, incredible guests, but it's really around, um, it's really around the Ted talk. And so the Ted talk is really, is really, um, motivated the book, the summit and the docuseries. And it's really this, it's really, uh, there's 5% of the time that you spend with your doctor. There's 95% of the time outside of that. So I want to empower people to be cancer thrivers. I want them to, you know, I'm not saying to do one certain thing. I want to empower them to find what that thing is that really fulfills them. And so from there, I want to teach uh, modalities about stress. And so our real big global dream and this, and, 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 and this is amazing because I really in my heart feel like it's not a matter of when. It's a ma I mean, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. This is going to happen. We're going to create white-labeled cancer retreats all over this planet. And people are going to literally get pulled out of their stressful environment and we're going to have 100 or 200 cancer thrivers there. And we're literally going to show them how to stop living the life that they are right now and start living the life of, of, of purpose and, and really give them more empowerment. And that's the most inspiring thing to me is to go to these events and hug these people and tell them that they're not alone and make sure that that cancer is not this isolated disease mm. anymore. I mean, they put the infusion centers in the place in the hospital where people can't see it on purpose. They do that on purpose mm. because they don't want to scare they don't want to scare other people with the way that we look. And that's I have a I have a problem with that. That's that's horrendous. I want these cancer thrivers to come out in the open and 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 really change and inspire their lives. And so that's the direction I'm going. Isn't Love it funny? It just reminds me. You made me think that you know often the 
you know, our greatest obstacles become our greatest opportunities. And you really bring that, you embody that cord. And in the same way, spinal cord um, ward is also very similar in that people find it very confronting. I remember people wouldn't come to see me in the spinal ward because you go into a spinal ward and everyone's in wheelchairs, yeah. you know, bolts in their yeah. head. And it's, you know, oh my gosh, there but by the grace of God go I. So again, it's, you know, sort of confronting. And I have to echo what you said about um, cancer because I, um, I'm an ambassador for Spinal Cure Australia and Red Bull Wings for Life and again we're pushing to find a cure for spinal cord injury and um, I believe it's not a matter of um, if it's a matter of when so you know we're working towards you know with spinal cord injury with cancer you know the body is an incredible magnificent um, machine and capable of extraordinary things absolutely love it Go and connect with Janine Shepherd on Instagram and Facebook. Go and connect with Court Davies on Facebook, Instagram. Look up their TED Talks uh, because these are seriously inspirational people. And again, I'm just so grateful uh, that you two have been able to share your time and your experiences. Obviously, there's no holds barred through this, this chat. So hopefully that's been of use to everyone. Before we go, is there just one final tip or, or comment or anything at all that you want to share with people who might be going through some type of adversity or thinking that there's no way out of the situation that they're in right now? Yeah, well, you know, my catchphrase, what I say to people uh, when, I, when I talk is that, you know, something that I taught myself as my mindset as a young girl was I learned to love the hills as an athlete. And, you know, we often hide or run from the things that we fear the most and the magic happens on the other side of the hill. And let me say that, you know, this is based on Freud's pain and pleasure principle. We're actually, he says, biologically driven to um, seek pleasure and avoid pain. But I say, turn towards those hills. Turn, turn towards those things that you fear the most because that will show you what you're capable of. And the magic happens on the other side of the hill. Wow. I mean, you and I, I we, we're a lot alike. I mean, I, <laughs> I was going to say where you place your focus is where you place your energy. And if you think about that, it's... If you're focusing on everything that's wrong with your life, that's where you're placing your energy. If you're focusing on the opposite of that and moving in the right direction, that's where you're placing your energy. So think about that. Think about where your focus is because your focus is where your energy is and that is where you'll follow. That's the where you'll go. Brilliant notes to follow up, to finish up on there. Thank you so much to both of you. And thank you thank everyone you. for, uh, thank for you, tuning in as well. Again, if you've got any questions or anything like that that you weren't able to ask during the live or if you're watching the replay, or even reach out to them personally or drop it in the comments. I'm sure they'll be willing to help you uh, as much as you want to help as many people as we can. So thank you very much. for Happy birthday, in. Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs>